Would you please be so kind to introduce yourself to the audience of uh, uh, the Nexus uh, Institute? Where do you come from? Um, um, what is your uh, 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 what's your background? That kind of things. Thanks so much, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I am an American philosopher. My degrees are from Stanford and from Harvard, where I work with people like John Rawls, Robert Nozick, Tim Scanlon, the great days of Harvard philosophy. My career has been in Britain, and I am now the Chair of Philosophy and Law at the King's College London School of Law. Being here at the heartland of, of Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, will that be part of the problem or part of the solution when it comes down to how to save the world? Humanity is moving from its old problems to its new. The old problems were crises of ignorance. We didn't understand the world well enough to manipulate it, to solve our problems. 300 years ago, we didn't understand the plague. It wiped out a third, half cities all over the world. Now we understand those kinds of problems. Ignorance no longer plagues us. Our new problems are not crises of ignorance, the crises of our own invention, our computers, are so powerful, so present, and so sapient, we can hardly keep anything from them anymore. Our weapons are so mighty, so devastating, they threaten human life on the earth. Even climate change is a crisis of invention. Isn't it poignant? All of these machines that we've built, the smoke coming off them, all these people living longer, eating better, traveling more to see the world, to see each other. Isn't it poignant that our inventions are avalanching into this mortal nature that might really be problems for our grandchildren? Those are the crises of invention. The hard things about the new crises are the ads are so tightly wound up with the goods. How can we keep all the blessings of our technology and our industry while not allowing them to threaten a very way of life? How does that relate to uh, the title of this uh, uh, new book of you, which I read with great pleasure, Blood Pile? There's a strange thing about our world. Natural resources, which should be a blessing, are in so many places a curse. There's one statistic just to sum it up. If you think of all the progress that the developing world has made in the last generation, China, India, even Africa is doing so much better, except, except the countries that have oil. Countries that have oil are no richer, no freer, and no more peaceful than they were even in 1980. That's shocking. We can think of Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Sudan. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. All of these countries are cursed by oil. And that's because of one very old, very bad rule from the past that we just haven't reformed yet. The rule that basically says, for oil, might makes right. Whoever can control oil by force these days, our law says we rely on for them. So when Gaddafi took over Libya in a coup a long time ago, the world started by Libya's oil from him. And then years later, when rebel groups took over those same wells from Gaddafi, it became legal for all of us to buy Libya's oil from the rebels. The rule says whoever has the most guns will get a huge amount of money from the world, and that money gives them absolute power. The money comes in with no strings attached, it never has to be paid back, and of course the power is unaccountable to the people of the country who have to watch while their resources are sold off their own control. That money comes in, if it goes to rebels or armed groups, they can use it to buy more weapons. If it goes to an authoritarian, the authoritarian can use it to buy the muscle and the loyalty he needs to stay in power. And if it's the Saudis who get the world's money for oil, then they can use that money to spread their extreme 
intolerant version of Islam around the world. And that's the version of Islam that we now see mutating into jihadi violence, not only in the Middle East and Asia, but also in Europe and maybe even here in America. Is this also the explanation how it is possible, though, that on the one hand, um, Saudi Arabia is, um, you know, the fertile ground for so much extremism uh, spreading all over the world uh, 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 in the form of ISIS and other monsters. At the same time, um, it's now April 2016, and President Obama is paying his respect again to the king of Saudi Arabia, instead of standing up as he could stand up against Mr. Putin or Gaddafi or whatever. In the short term, it always makes sense to do business as usual. In the short term, it always makes sense to try to make an alliance with the authoritarian regime. How's that done? How's that strategy worked in the past 40 years? How did it work with the Shah of Iran? How did it work with Gaddafi? How did it work with Saddam? How did it work with Bashir, Sudan, Bashar, Syria? How is it working to try to keep the absolute power of oil in check by making alliances? But look, you just told us that you have studied at Harvard with the greatest professors there. Obama also was a student at Harvard, the Harvard Law School. Why is it that you understand something he apparently doesn't understand? John Rawls said, a politician looks to the next election. The statesman looks to the next generation. The philosopher looks to the permanent conditions of humanity and how they can be made better. Politicians always have to look to the short term. It's up to us as philosophers and as citizens to look to the longer term interests of our country and the world as a whole. Do we find there a clue for what will save the world? Yes. Tell us. The clue to saving the world is depth of perception. It is seen from both eyes at once. So the world is a terrible place compared to what it should be. Violence, extremism, climate change, resource damage. But the world is a much better place than it was. We really are living better than we were even 60 years ago. The world is richer, human lives are longer, fewer women die in childbirth, literacy rates are high as they've ever been, more democracies in the world than ever, and Shocking as it seems, this is the most peaceful time recorded in human history. Both of these things are true. The world is terrible compared to what it should be, but it's better than it was. And learning from the ways the world has gotten better can give us solutions for the problems to come. And can get us to keep faith with our ancestors who struggled so hard to overcome their challenges, which were at least as good. That's the one that